Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Bald Explorer reading with me, Richard Vobes. We are reading, of course, The Wisdom of the Fields by H.J. Massingham, and we're on a chapter called The Cornishman in Wiltshire. Um, hello to you. Hello to TurboStream, who is out there all eager and ready to watch. I hope we're coming over nice and strong. And to Audrey Forbes Hamilton, who has popped in. Hello to you. Lovely to see you. I seem to have got a bit of a... I must have bitten my inside. I was going to say it was an ulcer on... You know, like you get an ulcer on the inside of your mouth. I think I've bitten the inside of my mouth. Uh, Poshington Tono. Good afternoon to you. Andrew Norris back again. Hello. Uh, yes, this is the uh, regular reading. I, for those that don't know, I did an earlier little impromptu live with my friend Mark English just to really demonstrate the studio and had a, a lovely, lovely few moments on there just chatting about our day and just acquainting him with the studio that I've built here in my back room and also doing a live. I've since put a jumper on because it's gone a bit cooler. Hello to uh, Andrew Norris and Ed Loud. Nice to see you. The lovely Julia has got some friends round, uh, which is um, so she may or may not be 100 percent in attendance. The lovely Julia is usually um, doing a bit of um, moderating, but uh, generally we don't need it on this particular afternoon thing because everyone's so good. Uh, TurboStream says that I'm just finishing homemade soup made mostly up the with from allotment fair how lovely i'm afraid to say i've been a bit naughty and had um a fit, a sausage and chips i'm sure the sausage is probably processed to death and the chips well very potatoey quite chunky and fried in oil of course but it was a treat because i had a guest down and you know when they come down to worthing take them down to the pier it was lovely on the pier and have fish and, and sausage and chips. And I do that so rarely, so I think that's all good. I'm going to have to go and um, reorder my next veg box uh, a little later on today. Uh, Turbo Street says, marrow, potato and apple. What, soup? How interesting. Ed Loud, nice to see Mark earlier. Couldn't stay, sadly, was on a walk. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. It was a quick impromptu thing. Um, we recorded a video... Um, which will go out on Thursday morning. Um, tomorrow is all about Dexter Cows. Anyway, we'll carry on with our reading. Thank you so much for coming back. It's lovely to see you. Uh, all good fun. So we got to chapter... I don't, I can't remember what chapter it is now. It was quite... Excuse me, Yori. I was up early. I've got to be up early tomorrow. I've got to go and be in... Godalming uh, tomorrow at 7.30 in the morning and then drive down to Wiltshire to walk around a battlefield with Julian Humphreys, Battlefield Trust expert, to make a video for later on in the week. So I'm going to need an early night tonight. Uh, this is chapter 10, part four on chapter 10, if you're following in those modes. On our subsequent journeys, I came to realise that the story of the Cornish farm was the key to the whole countryside. The farm represented an allegiance to certain principles, and what we saw over hundreds of miles was either a series of local versions of them, or a flat contradiction of them, or a transitional stage between the two. The succession of pictures passing as in a film across a screen blended with Hoskins' own observations, with the object of our travels, and with a question in my own mind. In what particular way did Chapter 2 of his life, after he had turned his back on his home, differ from Chapter 1? I was content to wait for the answer. In the meantime, I was noticing various phases of the country life thrown on the screen which carried me from chapter one to chapter two before I had heard the latter from his own lips. We travelled twice, far and wide, over the open and rather melancholy country to the southern western Cotswolds, west of Malmesbury, north of Bristol and south of Thornbury. First we went to see a rick in the Severn Valley and then another in 
the Duke of Beaufonts, or Beaufonts Park, at Badminton. Perhaps this country had suffered from being only on the edge of the Cotswold tradition and from its closeness to the coal-bearing region by Bristol. The small towns, Yate, Iron Acton and Sodbury's and others, were active enough and yet were and yet are invested with an indescribable air of decay. The rich and unusual cross at Iron Acton, the OG curve of the main street at Shipping Sodbury, seemed relics of a past inconceivably remote. How many of our market towns and villages have lost these lovely curves in their high streets? Chipping Camden, Castle Coombe, Burford, Sherbourne, Painswick, Tame, Malmesbury, Ledbury, Ludlow, Lyme Regis, Marlborough, Burton on the water. All the way in the country we saw more gates open than shut, more gates that could not be shut than could, more gates broken than whole, tossled heaps of straw by the stacks, dishevelled combined fields, stacks growing out at stacks growing out, tumbled or gaping dry stone walls, ivy covered trees, indifferently ploughed fields, weedy pastures, dilapidated farm buildings, even barbed wire sagging or twisted. Escaping the May frosts on the high plateau, the apple trees had presented a bumper crop to graceless man, while Britain is being supplied with Canadian apples, our own lie rotting on the ground, or trees, or on the ground or trees, or the cookers and eaters were being used for cider. Thistles and thorns abounded on the pastures, and tons of wood sprawled about in the coppices. Part of this dereliction may have been due to the absentee pluralist farming one man running several farms at a distance from one another, which is prevalent in these parts of the Cotswolds and quite unchecked by the War Committee. Except for the ploughland, immeasurably inferior to the barley lands I had seen that I had seen 15 years before, the Cotswolds looked as I had seen them just before the war, a great country with a great, con with a great, a great country with a great tradition in ruins. Though tens of thousands of acres had been dragged from wasteland to cornland, the countryside was as empty as ever. In some mysterious way the wilderness had become bountiful without ceasing to be wilderness. It was a paradox of decay and plenty. A dying man had risen from his bed, not made whole, but still dying. The flax rick in Badminton Park got third prize. It might have done better if the flax straw had not been banged like butter to make a tidy effect. In a flax, in a flax rick it is the straw that counts, not, as in a corn rick, the grain. The plenty of wheat, but plenty of wheat straw had been used in the roof and there was a pronounced ridge it was well bottomed with straw, though not faggots, and the whole was well proportioned and guarded against the winter. If a rick has a good appearance, you may be sure it has served its purpose, which is not ornamental at all. Yet this fairly craftsmanlike rick did not look happy with the park, which had itself passed over from the ornamental to the productive. A great deal of the tim handsome timber had been felled, but the sacrifice had not prevented much wastage of wood which lay about with none to make use of it. Huge sprawling fields had been carved out without the smallest order or adjustment to the scene. They had been combined, and you can always tell where the combine harvester has been, by the signs of the... Ab by the signs... Sorry... Huge sprawling fields had been carved out without the smallest order or adjustment to the scene. They had been com combined, 
and you can always tell where the combine harvester has been by other signs than the absence of bricks. The hole looked as though a brutal utilitarianism had broken in and impatiently started mass-producing. If anything got in our way, sorry, if anything got in the way, out with it or down with it. Was it a sign that if you break the cycle of the self-supporting husbandry, even if only in one place, the whole structure of farming falls to pieces? To try and replace it by expediency is like stopping a leak with a piece of paper. The same note was struck, though, in a different way when we went to see another rick we visited on a farm in the Severn Valley. It was at Itchington, on the Triassic Red Marls, whose texture is not dissimilar to the Cotswolds brash, though they go down much deeper. On a Cotswold, the buildings were of stone. As a more significant likeness, but a more significant likeness were their spacious and largeness of conception. The cow stalls, for instance, were entered by a row of broad rounded arches like a Norman arcade and giving easy access to the midden. It is impossible to do a round of, of the farms in the West Country without being struck by the generosity and stateliness of their buildings. They represent farming in the grand style and nearly always they are now, as they were, in rags. Their farmers have usually emerged from between the war tribulation with the marks of deep with the marks of it bitten deep into them. They have no expectation and they have no expectations for the future and regard this fleeting prosperity of the present with a certain irony and detachment. They are like a patient man with a flighty wife who deserts him, ruined him, and has returned to him in her adversity, but is ready at any favourable moment to bolt again with a rich lover. It's a bit unfair, isn't it? This one was in his 90th year, but still his two sons taking an active part in the farm management. His farm, being low-lying, had been taken in hand by the catchment or drainage board, and he was worried by the mess it had made of his brook. He took us half a mile through his fields to the flax rick. It was good, but not quite good enough, though the combined reed and though of combined reed and embellished it was good but not good enough, though of combined reed and embellished by the comely West Country fashion of girdling the roof with twisted straw bonds. Near at hand was the brook, and we witnessed what had happened to thousands of its like over the length and breadth of England. First, the withies that hold the banks are cut. Not all, but too many of them. Then the ex then the excavator lowers the bed, speeds up the flow, takes the water off too quickly and dumps the mud that becomes a hotbed of germinating weeds on the bank. We saw precisely the same thing over miles of the Sedgemoor Rhines and I have described in Chapter 8 what happened to the Herefordshire Lug. The impression was strong of an old and stable order disrupted. For this once distinguished farm must at one time have followed the same laws as the farm on the Cornish River. Here was the man beside me who had been educated on that farm. He was now a full man, not only in his prime, but enriched both by what he had learned at his father's steading and by what he had to unlearn in his subsequent career, in his subsequent career away from it. The unlearning had been a potent of force as the learning, but it was as though what he had learned, it was through what he had learned that he had acquired the strength and wisdom to unlearn. It is the same with others who are feeling their way by a different way through civilization in a spiritual run as patent as the physical ruin of the great Cotswold culture but the earth is primary, and this is what makes Hoskins' history important. 
I gathered something of what blended experience from the talk in the farmhouse where we took an ample tea with the farmer. It was one of those varieties of wheats. What wheats were fitted to what soils, what resisted disease and what not, and what were the peculiarities of each strain. The company listened to Hoskins almost with awe, though they were wheat growers of discrimination. We went far beyond his hear we went far beyond his hearers, not only in the breadth and intimacy of his knowledge, but in the stress he laid upon the effects for human nitrogen in growing the right wheat in the right soil. His ecological his ecological concept of the integration of soil and plant was a scientific one, but it was derived from what he had observed on his father's farm. Hoskins is now the chairman of the National Institute of the Seven sorry, it's the National Institute of Agricultural Botany. In the very year which saw us at his farm in the very year that saw us at this farm in the Seven Vale, it had eliminated from the list of recommended varieties of seed wheat whose foreign strains were import, together with the lack of husbandry in cultivating them and of humus in feeding them, and, and has landed us with a host of diseases. The Institute is, for such study and indigenous strains, 16 only, as Holdfast, Redman, Yeoman, Steadfast, Rampton Rivet and Little Joss, traditional wheats whose very names symbolise their validity. In this stroke on behalf of the in this stroke on behalf of our home wheats, I could trace the influence of the home farm in Cornwall. I am sorry, but I have absolutely no idea of what he's saying. I'm again I seem to be just reading words. He's got very very difficult to read in the last section of this book. I hope you're getting something out of it because I've really no idea what he's talking about. The rick that got second prize was on high ground above Camerton North. No, it wasn't. The rick that got second prize was on the high ground above Camerton, north of the Somerset Coal region at Radstock. It was notable how much indifferent stacking we saw, though it was better than the year before. One was trimmed, the cardinal sin against flax, the whole of the the whole of whose straw, roots and all, must be preserved intact. Another in Wiltshire had its thatch growing out because the sheaves had been pushed too fast through the threshing drum. Others were over paddled. Some were architecturally amateurish with well thatched roofs. Others reverse. One had humped roof angles. Another would be ridgeless, another innocent of how to spring, i.e. recess or taper, the floor from the eaves of the stem. Wiltshire, once the node of high craftsmanship for all the neighbouring counties, was comfortably inferior to all of them when we visited. They were a striking example of what preoccupied Hoskins in his talks with me on our long journeys, how to find the road back to craftsmanship and a true husbandry. The flax ricks scattered over the countryside were fumblingly attempting that very thing. But the ricks, and there was three of them, at Camerton had achieved it. From their eminence overlooking that ancient land whose dells and folds conceal so much ruined beauty, evoked from man, once in harmony with nature, they proclaimed it. The more refreshing to us who emerged from the mining villages, where even the bath stone is forced to mean... The more refreshingly to us who had emerged from the mining villages, where even the bath stone is forced into mean and ugly shapes, strangely at variance with the pretentious front doors. The ricks were small and round, each crowned with a simple finial at the apex and zoned with pegged straw bonds, each at the right distance from the other. They were finely sprung 
and the grace of this manner of building is at one, as in tr all true craftsmanship, with its utility. The eaves project projecting, projecting, the eaves projecting well over the stem, the combed reed, red wheat, the finish of the whole announced the same unity. These ricks were surrounded by others of wheat, as elegant, and the groups made a composition of tranquil care and industry in contrast with others on the further fork of the ridge across the valley, whose farmer had been modern enough to be in a hurry. A little further on, the noble tower of Bathford Church, with its elongated stair turret, commands the Avon Valley. The sign I had just seen... The sign I had just seen of a feel the sign I had just seen of a feeling back towards good workmanship must, if it prevails in the end against the pressure of the age, find its way likewise to those first principles which that tower declared. The great tithe barn of Great Coxwell both were made one. On our way from this exhibition, expedition, we passed a tractor pulling a cultivator and a harrow. The theory was that the driver was doing a double job in one and so saving labour. What he was really doing was halving the efficiency, in the older sense of the term before it became to mean costings and profits, because each implement was performing about half of what it should have done. This started Hoskins off on a series of reflections about the machine in modern architecture. Though they covered several days of many though they covered several days of many miles, I conveniently string them together here as a prelude to the second part of his biography. He attacked it on grounds that, to the best of my knowledge, have never properly been ventilated or are the very reverse of sentimental ones, no idea what he's talking about, namely that it introduces into farming certain elements detrimental to a good, that is to say, practical husbandry. First, it produces certain harmful effects upon the driver himself. The most obvious of these are gastric ulcers, the consequence as much of the sitting position and its effect in cramping the stomach as of bad food. Sensorially, its fumes dull the sense of smell, a faculty to which Hoskins attached much importance. Psychologically, it induces laziness. The tractor driver despises the hard work of the older countrymen and soon, my friend said tartly, he will need an elevator to lift him onto the seat. I was reminded of Chesterton's lines on Dr Mandragon, the millionaire. Besides a dandy little machine, cunning and neat as ever was seen, with a hundred pulleys and cranks between, made of metal and kept quite clean, to hoist him out of this healthful bed every day of his life and wash him and brush him and shave him and dress him to live a simple life. No idea really what any of this is mean. I'm sorry, this is all just beginning to be one difficult um, uh, thing. I don't know whether I, I, are you are you getting anything from this? Is this this just seems incredibly laboured and incredibly heavy? Suddenly he was he was really good earlier, and now it's 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 just like pulling teeth. The laziness in its turn, foisters, foisters neglect, so that the work of the ploughing is nearly, is nearly always scamped, the furrows badly turned and the plough badly set. Mechanisation, in fact, has supplanted quality, but since quality cannot be assessed in figures, it is not realised today of what has been lost. Hoskins was equally pioneering in comparing the tractor with the horse. In former days, we were to be seen... In former days were to be seen well-groomed horses on a well-groomed farm and the carter himself well-dressed in his leather and corduroys. But on the mechanised farm, these added cares were superfluous. Superf super, yeah. If the machine goes wrong, it is the 
it is the outside mechanic who puts it right. If the horse ailed, it was the responsibility of the carter. Genuine improvement of tools can only come from those who use them. A man says, now I have a tractor, I keep two cows instead of one horse. But actually, he has two exporting units for a single self-sufficient one. The cows in exporting the minerals in milk are exporting the farm, while the horse in his labourer, his manure and ultimately his bones, is rendering back to the farm what he takes from it. For the, tra for the tractor, everything is imported, none of which goes back as residue fertility. But since the tractor can be costed to a penny, but not the horse, the machine can be made to look the more efficient. So if a farm is mechanised, it's called a good one. This was a point he often canvassed, the indebtedness of the machine to external sources, the horses being only his shoes and only those used on the roads. The horse dovetailed into the farm economy as the tractor could never do. The advantage of the horse ploughman walking behind his implement was that his foot, foot trod on the earth just turned. But how can a tractor driver see what's happening behind him? The petrol engine is used by the engineer farmer as a matter of course, while the farmer engineer calls it in only on an emergency such as lack of labour. Again, to cultivate the land needs apprenticeship and the term is meaningless for a tractor. Is there the same love for the animals as in the days of the horse? It is replaced only by a liking for the machine. The business farmer puts the name of his cow on a plaque in the stall for, own, for showmanship. But Molly's homely cowman has no need to remind himself of her name. And really, this is just um, incredibly difficult to comprehend and read. I am struggling with this. Just, I just need a break. I need a break because this is just, this is uh, just. It's nice to have made it. Uh, this chapter is not so interesting, says John. I know. I laughed at the vision of the hoisting a tractor driver into the cab. Something worth reading is rarely easy on the ear and tongue till the end. The difficult uphill parts of the journey when reading lead to a better view at the top. Well, um, I, not if I don't understand what the hell he's talking about. I have to say that it really helps. If you're reading something to others, it helps that you can understand what they're saying so that you can put the intonations in. I'm really struggling again. It's just, it, this is like a bit of navel gazing. I mean, I'm getting what he's saying. He's basically saying the horse is better than the tractor. There, I've said it in one sentence. We didn't need yards and yards of absolute rubbish. Come on, Massingham, you've been so good up until now. Don't lose it towards the end. The criticisms from a man who was one of the first in England to drive a tractor were spiced by what we saw of the work of the Combine in Wiltshire. No fewer than a hundred were imported into the country in 1944. Even in the Downland or Wold areas of other counties we visited together, suitably for what might be called its ravages, there was nothing like so many. In one field we passed, between Marlborough and Devizes, the combine had driven over and crushed the wheat sheaves on an adjoining piece tied by a binder. A reprimand by the cultivation officer was answered by, but we couldn't stop the machine. So far, so far have we travelled from what was uttered 2,000 years ago. The land is for the machine and not the machine for the land. So, <coughs> so much so that Hoskins, a man least given to any I know to explosive statements, remarked to me that those who were suffering from our bondage of automatism, automatism, or automatism, but feared to speak their revolt, were like the French marquis waiting underground for the word of deliverance. There were three infallible means of identifying at sight 
the brand of the combine on the September fields of Wiltshire, which looked to me like a vast empty camp of stockless mechanised farmers. One was by the policy of scorched earth, namely by burning the straw after it. The second was by the broad stripping of green lanes along the entire length and breadth of the stubble field. These were where the grain dropped by the machine had sprouted. I learned from Hoskins after I had returned home that he had observed the same phenomenon in Oxen, Bucks, Suffolk and Cambridgeshire. The third was by the Farouche appearance of the field. I don't know what Farouche, that must be a French word, F-A-R-O-U-C-H-E. To take the last first, I have never in all my wanderings for 30 years over the face of England seen cornfields like those in 1944 in Wiltshire, one of the most progressive and highly mechanised agricultural counties in England. Here is an example, one of scores. The field was a large hedgeless one and looked as though the troop of backchances in Keats's poem had charged madly into it, trampling down the straw in an ecstasy of the vine and biting off the ears. It is said that one advantage of the combine field is that it makes good cover for partridges. As one member of our party remarked, it was good cover for rhinoceroses. Parting with some... Something on my finger here. Parting with some effort the tangled clumps of straw, we could see the hard ground strewn with countless grain and weed seeds. On the edge of the field stood a caterpillar tractor, ticking over and attracted to a five furrow plough, and attached even to a five furrow plough. So the ploughman told us, and he had 18 years' experience of ploughs. We had to take him at his word because most of the plough and all of the shares were invisible. They were wrapped up in straw as though the plough had come by post in a straw packing and the ploughman was busy with a pitchfork unpacking it. It had been impossible to burn the straw because there was ammunition that because there was an ammunition dump close by. Elsewhere, there were no such obstacles. One of the purest landscapes and richest green soils in England is the edge of the Vale of Pusey between Alton Priors and Allington, backed by the long line and masterly modelling in coal, headland and saddleback of the Marlborough Downs. The very cottages of timber, brick and stone responded to the simple and economic economised grandeur of the natural composition by touches of special elegance, curved struts, rhythmic sweep of thatch and tile-headed oriel windows. The distant spire of Bishop Canning's church serenely clears its ramp of trees. Another region of organically impress... Another, another religion as organically... Im, what? Another religion as organically impresses itself upon the landscape. No idea what that sentence means. The long barrow of Adam's grave forms one slope of green conical mound and below it the land falls away to a wide terrace supported by flying buttresses on two sides. The natural, take, the natural takes the form of man-made architecture. The man-made had to conform to but enhance the natural design. Lofty Tan Hill, directly opposite, held memories of the great sheep fairs thereon, stressing the particularity of this place as great in husbandry and beauty. But now the land was sheepless, stockless, while the green symmetry of the flowing downs confronted a black smudge, an area of burnt-out desolation. For to burn the straw gives a saving of three pounds and sixpence an acre of cost, a short time before, it had been a barley field, as we could tell by the strips of green made by the self-sown grain and the myriads of kernels lying on the ground, each one with a black spot on it from the burning straw. The disgrace of this field was dramatised by the grace of its setting. It is said of those who advocate the cultivation of the earth by good husbandry that they are warped by nostalgia and cramped by traditionalism. 
that in their desire to keep farming free of all taint of commercialism and industrialism, they grope about in a sort of medieval twilight towards a mystical state which the symbols are the maypole and the night soil cart. The remedy, it is argued, for this mystical mug wumpery is the rationalisation and standardisation of the agricultural industry in the interests, viz the vested interests, of international trade. Food is not grown to satisfy people's needs, but mass-produced as a factor in the exchange value of competing for a favourite trade balance. Here was the rationalised, viz. laborless, laborless, laborless farming in visible action, or what has been called combine and matches farming. On the downs above us, the Bronze Age colonists of Avebury had cultivated barley with the digging stick. And this primitive scratching was superior farming practice to what I saw below the downs 2,000 years later. The truth is, as Hoskins put it in an appendage to his comments on the tractor, that the combine cannot take crops too good for it. It is simply by a method by which the inferior farmer with thin crops can beat the good one with heavy crops by cheapening the process. He compared the combine farmer with a roundsman who buys a faster car to do a quicker round and so sell more goods. It is a process impossible with horse farming or spade cultivation because the only difference there is in the quality of the work. If the combine were improved in an attempt to stem the waste, it would become even more cumbersome and unmanageable than it is already. It is only advan its only advantage in that it allows the grain to ripen in a standing ear. Its only excusable its only excusable use is for the short termed barley, and we see its only advantage in that it allows the grain to ripen in the standing ear. Its only excusable use is for short-stemmed barley, and we had seen what that was like under Tan Hill. The potash from the ashes is the merest short-term stopgap against the drain of fertility. Mechanisation of the land has, in fact, been adopted to fit into the modern economic, e economics based on a purely quantitative production. Yet, as we'd seen it, it had defeated its own short-sighted ends. The folds shall be full of sheep. The valleys also s shall stand so thick with corn that they shall laugh and sing, but not by the power farming and efficiency. If the modern combine farmer answered his critics in some such terms as these, combine farming is unquestionably wasteful both in grain and in straw, it is using up fertility because the chemical bag is the only fertiliser to replace the drain on organic plant foods. It is expediency farming, but we cannot help it. Nearly all our labour has been taken from us. Our livestock has been depleted by a bad policy and good husbandry, through no fault of its own, has been at a discount. If such were his plea, the edge of criticism would be turned. But what he actually does say is that he must move with the times, as though the waste and the expedients were not only inevitable now, but part of a future prosperity. Thus, he allies himself to a mentality which thinks of human beings as mobile males, immobile females, dilutes, or just bodies, Am I talking gobbledygook? I think I am. He becomes a victim of a habit of mind caricatured in the following, taken from the pages of the Farming Journal. Mechanisation of farming has, to a large extent, stopped short at replacing the horse. There are still more farm employees working with their arms and legs than there are on tractors, and this is likely to be uneconomic in the future. Unfortunately, the natives of this armless and legless utopia will, by such farming methods, have nothing to eat. Oh, that's that was...
that's the end of that chapter. And that is just so difficult. Uh, let's have a look. The farmer next door was John Deere's tractor. They called it Deere because it costs so much to buy an upkeep. I'm not at all surprised. What a thought provoking comparison between tractor and a horse, says Lee Lawson. I hope I, I don't know whether I mean, it seems so difficult to say that the modern way isn't isn't as good as the old way in 1944. Uh he is feeling nostalgic for the horses and the plough like today's farmers feel about the little old Ferguson and David Browns. Wonder if this was the central ammunition dump at Moncton Far Farley in Wiltshire, says Ben Reeve. The village has a suspiciously wide avenue of trees on Google Maps, does it indeed? Uh, which can handle a C-130 Hercules aircraft. During the Cold War, it could have flown people in the nearby turnstile bunker by box tunnel Ed Loud well spotted that it always amazes me that some of the Cold War air planning the places that were planned as makeshift runways perhaps pause today Richard says turbo stream uh, yes no possibly um, I'm just wondering whether I, there's one more chapter here called a Cornishman in Wiltshire but I may just ditch that chapter because if it's more about this bloke I mean, we get the measure that this chap Hoskins doesn't like modern farming. And I get that. So I might just skip that last chapter because I think it's just going to be more of the same. It talks about the, the road back and so on and so on. The next chapter after that is the epilogue. Morton Lewis says George Orwell would have nailed the idea in a page. Yes, it's interesting. He could. I'm just thinking. I've got um, George Orwell's Coming Up for Air, which is a good book. We could read that. We've got 20 minutes left, so we could just get to the end of this and do the epilogue. How about we do that? because uh, I can't stick another bad bit. He was brilliant. He is a brilliant author, but he's he's just trying to do his friend justice, but I think he's he's ruined it there. Personally. Certainly as a read out loud um, book. So this is the uh, this is the epilogue. And a quote by W.H. Hudson. The Inca system of government was founded on that iniqu iniquitous and disastrous doctrine that the individual bears the same relation to the state as a child to its parent, that his life from the cradle to the grave must be regulated for it by a power it is taught to regard as omnis omniscient. What wonder that a system so unspeakably repugnant to a being who feels that his will is a divinity working within him fell into pieces at the first touch of foreign invasion. For the whole state was, so to speak, putrid even before dissolution, and when it fell it mingled with the dust and was forgotten. That's just a, a quote at the beginning of the chapter. The modern Christian often judges contemporary society for reverting into health, heath, 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 heathianism, being a heathen, heathenism, I suppose that is. The modern Christian often judges contemporary society for reverting into heathianism, heath, heath, however you pronounce it. But the only fruitful analogies between the pre-Christian world and our industrial one are those of the Peru 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 Peruvian culture of the Incas and the later Roman Empire. The civilization of prehistoric per Peru was an elaborate form of state socialism which denied personal freedom and individual responsibility. The cult of the divine emperor at Rome 
was an idealisation of a city-state. It was no longer regional nor one of a constellation of towns as in medieval Italy and ancient Hellas, but the world city regarded as the supreme state. The modern German state, incomparably more barbarous and savage than the Peruvian, but founded on the same conception, is on the eve of the same dissolution and for the same reason as Hudson has described at the head of the chapter. Other industrial states must follow it into the dust if they catch the infection of its servile populace, omnipotent government and amoral technocracy at the disposal of great combines and syndicates like the intercession Grem Mine Shaft Fraden something industry. No idea, that must be a German something or other. Modern society has not reverted to the normal type of pagan culture. These, for all their diversity, was akin in springing from and maintaining the same root principle attached to the earth. The general mark of an industrial civilization is detachment from earth, yet the revival of agriculture in our own nation, not from choice but necessity, something happened Yet with the revival of architecture in our own nation, not from choice but necessity, something happened to us. Our national consciousness, derived from our rural past, pushed out a tender root into the soil and budded under the heavens. This stirring of new life expressed itself in the symbol of a yearly ceremony called Farm Sunday. Its name is a recognition as remote as it can be from the attempt on the other days of the year to degrade the farm into a mere business. Farm Sunday is the old rite of rogation in modern dress, with beating of the bounds, so often associated with it and left out. When the parson blessed the fields at rogation tide, the church was in the fields. At the harvest festival, the fields came to the church. Each was a symbol of the organic link between agriculture and Christianity, repeatedly stressed in the New Testament. Once only I have myself seen this ancient and moving ceremony, and that was at Chipping Camden in the early thirties. Beating the bounds was omitted. Nobody knew anything about it. But the procession, headed by the vicar and the choir, set out from the church porch to bless the fields, not at any point outside the village that had chanced to be convenient, but under a tall elm tree standing on the edge of Dover's Hill, the site both of an Iron Age earthwork and of a celebrated Olympic Games. Shakespeare undoubtedly attended these games. Master Shallow ran a greyhound at them, which Captain Dover and Endymion Porter revived after they had fallen into disuse at the end of the Middle Ages. They enjoyed such popularity that an anthology of poems, Annalella Dubrecia, was published about them, to which Michael Drayton, Samuel Daniel and other noted Elizabethan and Jacobean poets contributed. This elm was called the Ten O'Clock Tree because of the rays of the sun struck upon it at that hour, just as they do at dawn on Midsummer's Day on the altar stone at Stonehenge. Before the 14th century, when the older church by the town hall was in use, the sun, the older church and the site of the elm tree were all in alignment exactly at midday. Nobody can wonder about... Nobody can wonder about... So nobody can wander about among prehistoric monuments without noticing how often they were aligned to one another. The tree itself commands an extraordinarily spacious view from Braley's clump above the Vale of the Red Horse in Warwickshire to the Black Mountains in Wales. There is a much more than antiquarian interest in these details. They virtually prove that 
Rogation at Chipping Camden must in the past have been united with beating of the bounds. This ancient preambulation of the parish boundaries was a formal and periodic expression of the sense of the place, that is to say, of home. But thus making the circuit of the parish, its parishioners were making a declaration of their belongingness to it. By a ceremonial formality, they were uttering in unison the significant words, this is our home. At the same time, it's very clear that the rogation rite of blessing the fields, now resurrected under the title of Farm Sunday, is not an institution of the Church of England or even of the, church, of the Roman Church before it. It travels far beyond the Roman occupation of Britain, whether pagan or Christian. It dives so deep into the unrecorded past that the idea of a thanksgiving for the kindly fruits of the earth or the recognition that man's own powers are not great enough for him to grow and procure these fruits unaided may be considered, without exaggeration, as part of the whole human consciousness. The Catholic Church merely sanctioned this intensive, instinctive belief and purged it of certain debased elements that accompanied the decay of paganism. The Church of England did no more than maintain the con continuity. That continuity was only broken from what may now be called that continuity was only broken from what may be called the days of Adam by our own power age, though a power ten times greater than anything mechanical or electric we are able to employ would be puny compared to the power of a seed to a shoot. And by breaking this continuity and dismissing it as obsolete, we broke down the sense of home. For the combination of beating the bounds with rogation reveals a terrible sense of home. First, the sense of being at home in our own particular fields which, surprise, which supply us with our bread and attach us to them by innumerable other ties. Next is the sense of belonging to our own place. Next, next to this sense of belonging to our own place is that of belonging both to nature and to our own particular traditions which are anglicised versions of something universal in man. Lastly, there is, the seemingly, there is the seeming paradox of man's connection with some power beyond even this earth which supplies us with our needs, the power acknowledged in the fact of blessing the fields. Man lives by bread, the paragon of animals, but also as a spiritual being, not by bread alone. Our home is upon the earth. It is upon one spot of this earth, beloved over all. But it is also in the way we feel but cannot explain elsewhere and not in a transitory world governed by space and time at all. This I take to be the underlying significance of rogation that we have revived it under the name of Farm Sunday, is to confess to ourselves that, like the base Indian, we have thrown a pearl away and anxious to seek it once more. I have no idea what is going on about there again. This old ritual. So I think this... Wait a minute. Are we getting to a summing up? I think we are getting to a summing up. This is... Sorry, this is just... This, this has just been a waste of your time, I feel. The old rural England, based on workshop, farm and village, whether free or held by manor or church, was founded upon the concepts of personal property, administered as a duty no less than a right, as a social service no less than a safeguard of independence. The natural law of the Middle, Tudor and Stuart ages incorporated rules for good workmanship and the right use of property. This England, both in its economic and organic aspect, aspects of Cobbett's standard, was Cobbett's standard of reference in everything he wrote. It was an England whose structure was based on the natural law, and the natural law was the Christian abstract of man's double relation to heaven and earth. 
Our new science enriches it by discovering the livingness of the soil, the interdependence of living creatures and the rule of return. Like most writers occupied with rural England, I receive numeral letters, numerous letters from men in the services. They're always illuminating and all of them hunger for the same end, to live on the land. One of them has a particular quality about it which speaks for them all. The writer, who I may say is or was a squadron leader in the RAF, begins by saying that he had, after taking thought, reached certain conclusions about the hope of England's future, which tallied with those I and others have for many years put forward. After mentioning some of these conclusions, such as the dangers of thinking of the agricultural industry, the imperative need for yeoman farming, the illusions cherished by the planners and their kin, he puts his main point. The purpose of man's life should be, at any rate, in some measure, creative. Man is not an end in himself, but a means to an end, a means to God's end. How then can he be assured of a creative life? Many people hold that by giving a man a chance of a creative leisure, you can nullify the effects of deadening work. He believes this to be fundamentally unsound, and that creative leisure can never act as a substitute for creative work. The writer goes on, what we do in the army, navy and air force, what we, what, sorry, what do we, what, what do we in the army, navy and air force want to do after the war? The chance to do creative work. We want it passionately, most of us, because we are revolted in our subconsciouses by the uncreative work we are called upon to do. Work that allowed a man to express himself in it is good. Work that does not is bad. It kills a man's soul. How can this creative work be secured? By cultivating a small farm, not only for satisfaction that I would get out of the work, but because I now believe that the type of life is the only basis for a healthy life in post-war England. I long for a village community and village life. But, he continues, I have reached this finality too late. I have no training for this. The good life that I and my wife and children support with another job and an assured livelihood is waiting. Besides, what chance is the small farmer going to be given by planners in a post-war world? Am I to risk my family's welfare for a shot in the dark, for something, in fact, which the rulers of England have no intention even of allowing to survive? And the letter is signed, Yours in Perplexity. What about my perplexity? What advice could I give him? Was I to say something like this, England will not portray its native land again as it did in 1920? We have abandoned our former dreams of wealth at the expense of agriculture, both at home and abroad. We no longer pursue the mirage of a thumping trade ex export. We think now in terms of real, not fictitious, riches. No longer will our farmers be living on overdrafts at the bank. Never again will their produce be rendered artificially worthless by imported cheap food raised by half-ruined farmers on exhausted soils. We intend to alter our whole economic system and there is no danger of small farms being absorbed into larger ones. Therefore, you have no fear. Buy yourself a small farm and good luck to you. It is fairly clear that I could not say this. Yet what large issues this, yet what large issues this letter raises... It is asking what government is for, whether it is above all moral law and has no objections, no obligations towards the governed, especially those who have risked their lives to preserve it. It challenges its assumption of autocratic power for itself and those monopolists and controllers of money who traffic in foreign exchanges and markets. It questions its right to deny the opportunities for creative work to those who have deserved well of their country and to neglect or exploit the land of England at the will of economic forces that benefit neither land nor people. 
to frustrate the honourable and, more than that, the religious purpose of man like this, a true lover of his country, is to make man the mere pawns of polit power politics. Whether or no he would subscribe to the term, it was the natural law within him that had prompted my correspondence to write his letter. My correspondent to write his letter. It is the law that time cannot bind nor change and make invalid. Avebury prefigured it, Glastonbury formulated and sanctified it, Farm Sunday remembered it. The best of Covet was its evangelist, and to acknowledge and reinterpret is the redemption of England. We've got one half page to go, and that's the end of the book. It is not to be denied that modern society has made giant strides of discovery. But it is equally clear that it has mainly failed to apply the new knowledge for the benefit of mankind. The failure is so pronounced that it is dragging Western civilization nearer and nearer to some fall like Lucifer's. Perhaps it can be summed up as the loss of a design for living. To be destroying the earth, the birds, the beasts, fishes, vegetation and, most of all, soil, in order to make money out of it and for nearly every country in the world to be fighting either within itself or with other countries does not make sense. To be producing goods to perish at once in war and in mere quantity with no customers or no money to buy them does not make sense. Common sense is the cornerstone of a design for living. It is only the cornerstone, nor can the design be restored... Uh, sorry, but is it the only cornerstone? Nor can the design be restored by abandoning, abandoning the new knowledge and returning to the past. We cannot put the leaves back on the tree in December. But what we can do is find once more the living truth that crowned it with leaves and fruit. Of that living truth, the organic way of growth out of the fundamental realities is the beginning. On the material side, a self-supporting and organic agriculture is essential because it is because, sorry, because there is now no other way of feeding people of the world with food enough. By food, I mean nourishment from which the vital properties have not been removed or sacrificed by modern ingenuity. Oh, I can't say the word, but you know what I mean. Ingeniousness. In invading organic laws for the sake of profit. There is no other way of maintaining the fertility of the soil, that is to say, of passing on human life from age to age. There is no other way of building up resistance to deficiency diseases in man, beast, and plant and soil. To support ourselves by organic methods would lead us out of the economic wilderness by opening up vast new fields of employment in the home market by making use of local materials now wasted and by diverting trade and finance to national needs with which neither of them has had for many years anything to do with. And organic self-help cannot exist without the just price. But the spiritual side is just as real and urgent. And the just price, our practical need, was once, a was once a religious precept. Mr Montague Fordham has well said that the ag agricultural problem is not primarily ag agricultural or even political. It is a problem of statesmanship applied to national life. The organic way is also a means of developing character, independence, ownership, whether cooperative or individual, and a right relation with nature. These are implicitly spiritual needs and an indispensable part of a design for living. If fulfilled, they would at once correct the mechanistic bias of the age. The organic way is, in short, the only one 
that can bring us within the influence of those everlasting principles that govern mortal life. Taken as a whole, urban, modern urbanism is indifferent or hostile to religious principles. But Germany has given the world an example of what happens to a nation when it defies and murders them. We palter with them by turning values into valuations. Because Cobbett did link the organic way of life with eternal truths, I have made him the keystone of the book. He was, besides the most English, he was, besides, the most English of Englishmen. He possessed most of our virtues and few of our faults. To heed his vision of England would be to return to ourselves. And that's the end of the book. And um, I don't think we lost anything by not doing the penultimate chapter. Um, that was very difficult. The end, the last bit, you know, summed it up quite well. Um, he, he muddled the water, I think, with the last two chapters. I mean, the, the, the penultimate chapter I didn't read. But the, the last chapter, he started, I mean, he could have put that over a lot easier. Um and we're just over the time and I don't I don't want to hold you up and I want to finish this and I'll try and think of another book to read tomorrow. But um, it's been a fascinating read and it's been uh, vital in some ways to look back at somebody who was incredibly passionate about the traditional ways and the organic ways. And I think we have witnessed in the last 80 years the ways that we have plundered the land killed off the wildlife, um, grown farms to a huge extent, intensified the farming to an industry. So it's a factory that seeds go in one end and some sort of processed food comes out the other so that we think that that's the only way that we can feed a growing population. And there are those, obviously, that disagree with that. We've seen hedgerows ploughed up. We've seen... Um, governments paying um what, what do you call them the the um the i can't subsidies to farmers um to to almost to encourage them to grow more and all by you know and i say the government it's tax funded stuff and we've re we've worked out that the food isn't as good as it ought to be and we have a number of illnesses associated with too much sugar and too much processed food and, and all of that. And people are slowly, I think, beginning to understand and recognise that. But in our very fast-paced worlds, we, we don't like to recognise it. There's an essence in here of goodness and solid solidness and traditional values and as he said we can't go backwards we've got to take the technology forward with us but do it in the right way that i don't think that we're doing ourselves at the moment anyway that's it um an interesting read a difficult read at times a fascinating and emotional read other times i have enjoyed it generally apart from the last couple of chapters where it was really I was just struggling to understand and couldn't take the time to fully grasp a lot of his meanings and some of it was really, I think, unnecessary. But he was a writer of his times, as we will find out. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for coming on that journey. Um, just before I go, a couple of things to mention. Tomorrow, there is no reading. I'm, I'm going, well, I think I'm likely to not be here. I got a long journey so I think I probably won't do the reading, but I may not be back in time. But I should be back in time to do the Vogue show. Um, and Thursday, uh, there may be a new book or we may leave it till next week or something like that to crack on a new book and give ourselves a bit of a break, if that's all right. Um, it's very thought provoking, as uh, Morton says, um, they ignored St. Francis, then Cobbett, then this chap. Uh, what next, says Josh Stick, exactly. Um, 
Thor the Viking says, you are on the right way, Richard. Well read. I, I struggled. I appreciate that I struggled. Um, Dr. Vernon Coleman is good on this. But check out Carl something's YouTube channel is highly food supply chains are being disrupted by highly suspicious COVID, I imagine. Um, anyway, thank you so much. Um, I will catch up with you in due course. Take care. Have a good rest of the afternoon. I've got the evening off. It's not really off because I've got some editing and various other bits and pieces to do. But I'll try and think of another book and... Um, Maybe the best thing is we just take the rest of the week off and start afresh with our readings on Monday. How about that? Is that OK? Um, because we're going to start a new book and it gives me a few days to get my act together. All right. Take care. Thank you so much. Look after yourselves. Uh, thank you for being there. It's been great fun. Bye for now. Bye bye. <laughs>